threatened and very openly threatened by uh, black political consciousness or prisoners who even study African American history. Um, you know, there's found I knew people in, in long term solitary confinement here in California that had been uh, put there uh, because they were said to be gang associates, partially because they had Black Panther books. Uh, in Louisiana, when I was working undercover as a prison guard, I, we got a list of the books that were banned, and there was one that was called A uh, Hundred Years of Lynching, and it was, it was just a collection of news articles yeah. about lynching. And, you know, these things are banned because they say it affects the security of the institution. It's just, it's just so naked, and I think your situation is really, you know, is such an extreme example, but in some ways typical, you know, because you were such a... Um, you know, bold voice, um, you ended up locked away for 44 years. Yeah, well, you know, uh, Angola is a unique situation because it was a form of slave plantation. And like I say, you got about 15 families that go all the way back to child slavery. So the attitudes and the racism, is in particular against African Americans, is passed on from generation to generation. You know, and at the time, they had uh, virtually like all the civil jobs were not were filled by uh, white prisoners. You know, uh, the only jobs that uh, the blacks had were mostly in the field. Uh, and where you got paid like two cents an hour, you know, for, uh, you know, uh, backbreaking uh, agricultural work. And uh, so, you know, uh, there was a lot to organize against in, in Angola, you know. And uh, as I say, you know, uh, I had made a commitment to, 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 to the Black Panther Party and, and to social struggle. And so, you know, I, I did, you know, based upon the readings and the training of the, of the party, you know, uh, I organized, I educated, I, I, I agitated, and, you know, against, uh, uh, the brutality of the security force. Uh, you had something like 5,000 men being controlled by 300, uh, what well, they used to call them free men, right. and, 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 and the inmate uh, guards who were so brutal. I mean, yeah. you know, they were even more brutal than, than the, uh, the, the correctional officers who were working there, you know. And so, you know, I just took a head on me and Harmon, you know, and eventually the men who joined the chapter of the Black Panther Party. Uh, the other member, uh, uh, Robert uh, Hillary King, uh, he wasn't even, a, wasn't even in Angola when this correctional officer was found uh, murdered. And, but when he came about a week or so later, they locked him in solitary. So he spent 29 years solitary and he only got out he had his case overturned. Mm -hmm. Talk about how, how you ended up in solitary, what led to that? Well I was the first one that had been written. I, I had been uh, involved in organizing a work stoppage uh, that morning because of my, my job was in the uh, scullery in the dining hall. You know, I used to clean the pots that they used to cook food and stuff. But they were working God like 16, 17 hours a day, seven days a week. Mm -hmm. You know, and they were, you know, complaining amongst each other about. So, you know, I took the initiative and start explaining, to, you know, the, the unity, the uh, strength of unity, and they had, you know, uh, uh, human rights, they had, still had minimum constitutional rights, so, you know, and. Uh, they had the right to be truly treated in a humane way. And uh, so they had to do something to call the administration to be faced with, with a situation of, you know. The one thing about prison is they're trying to keep everything in-house. So if they keep everything in-house, then they can control, you know, the process and, and, and pretty much dictate the outcome out, uh, you know, come of, uh, of that situation. So they're very reluctant, uh, probably the most uh, painful form of protest is hunger strikes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, work stoppages and stuff, uh, you know. And 
so that morning, you know, when we got to what's called a snitching gate, is the last security gate before you go into the dining hall. Mm -hmm. They turned everybody around and said, you know, the prisoners were refusing to serve uh, anybody. And, you know, but I mean, I knew what was going on. So I went back to my dormitory. And uh, I was, you know, uh, where I work, you work one day on, one day off. Because it's, it's a very dangerous job. You, you uh, cleaning uh, pots and pans and stuff, and you're dealing with a lot of scalding hot water. You know? it's, and it was very uh, hard, very, very hard work, you know. And so uh, it was, this was my day off, you know. So I went back to the dorm, laid down, I think I fell off to sleep. And I, I don't know, maybe a half hour, you know, I woke up because uh, the security people was screaming and hollering and blowing whistles and, you know, uh, they was using the N-word, all you niggas get on the, line up on the walk and stuff, you know. And so, you know, I was on the very last union on what's called a walkway, you know, it's a concrete thing that go down with uh, units on each side, you know, uh, uh, you know, old pine, uh, wall, nothing like it yet, you know, and I was on the very last unit. So we lined up and on the way down there, you know, words start filtering back down the line that they had found a correction officer, a stab of death, and a pine unit. And so I was the very first one that uh, was locked up for an investigation, you know, uh, for Mr. Miller's death. And eventually Harmon, you know, and stuff. And, and some of the members who had joined the Black Panther Party, uh, we had established and stuff, you know. And, uh, you know, there was a lot of um, beatings and, and just sheer terror. And it was only of the black prisoners, you know. They, used to, they didn't interrogate any of the white prisoners or, 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 or brutalizing them or anything, you know. So I was put in, uh, and uh, the dungeon was called, we refer to it as the dungeon. It's a strip cell, you know, and you, you don't have any, any poisonous items or anything. And at that time, you were getting like two slices of bread three times a day. And, but I was placed in there, and uh, it was April 17th, 1972. And the next day, April 18th, I was transferred from the dungeon to what's called a CCR, cold cell restriction, which is solitary. You know? And you, in solitary, you're housed in a cell uh, 23 hours a day. You get one hour a day to come out and shower. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when we were first were placed in, in solitary confinement or CCR, you were only allowed to have like uh, a couple of change of underwear, some slippers, and nothing else, you know, and a Bible, you had to just put a Bible on the table. You weren't allowed to have, get newspapers, magazines, no, you weren't allowed radios or anything, TVs or nothing. You uh, write about the kind of, you, you, you wrote that uh, the fear that I might start screaming and never stop was always with me. That was something that I really related to um, from my short time in solitary, this feeling that uh, you're just kind of trying to keep that possibility of snapping at bay. Um, you did that for so long. I mean, how, do you, how did you kind of, was that uh, continuing, you know, was that fear always there that you, you might kind of yeah. panic? And how did you I mean, it's there now. I still, you know, I still suffer from claustrophobic attacks. Able to deal with them better now because of the fact that I can walk beyond nine feet. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but you know, yeah, I mean, you know, you, how how you never adjust to being locked in a nine by uh, six cell, twenty three hours a day. And I I was in solitary long in you know Harmon and not long in any other prison in, in the history of the United States. Uh, I was in solitary for 44 years and 10 months. And uh, I 
think what helped us was that, you know, we, we were not glued into the prison culture. You know, we, we were black panthers. We had a political conscience, political awareness. So we had a foundation mm -hmm. to work with. And so I think that happened. And, you know, and, and what really helped me, though, is, you know, when I was a young kid, a teenager, my mom was trying to teach you know, me values, you know, loyalty, devotion, dignity, pride, stuff like that. And of course, like most things, I rebelled against that. And, you know, I always say that the voice of the street was louder than my mama's voice. Mm -hmm. And the voice of the Black Panther Party was louder than the street. And so the part of the Panthers gave me purpose focus, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? To my knowledge, the Black Panther Party is the only political organization that would allow someone in prison to become a, a part of it, you know, as long as they upheld the principles and, and, the, and, and the philosophy of the black man party. So I think that had happened. But for me, it was still a struggle. I really didn't, you know, I was in my early 40s when all of the wisdom and, and self-education allowed me to understand the principles that my mom was trying to teach me and, and, and you know the strength and it gave me strength it was a foundation in which I was able to you know progress as a human being and you know uh, and so you know we we, we, gave, uh, we had a lot of respect from the prisoners in Angola because of what we were trying to do. So that automatically put us in what, which I guess you could say a leadership position. Mm -hmm. So that put tremendous demands on us because in order, you know, to be in a leadership position, we had to be able to, to lead. We had to have a, 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 a knowledge, you know, and, and, and wisdom and you know, and know how to organize the men we lived around. Uh, the tiers in CCR was, you know, you had 15 men on the tier, and you had about six tiers of CCR, you know. And so, uh, you know, uh, that, I think that gave us an advantage over the average prisoner, because the average prisoner is, is glued into the prison culture. Uh, Harmon and, and Robin and myself, we instinctively knew that if we were going to survive solitary confinement, that we had to turn out. We had to let whatever values we had be shaped by society and what was going on society, in society, not turn inward to the prison culture and no longer be concerned about society and how, how it was being shaped and whatever. You know. Mm -hmm. And so in time, you know, we, uh, you know, we organized the tiers we were on and we had, we developed, uh, uh, you know, uh, educational uh, classes, you know, I think I've been asked what's the, what's the, you know, proudest, my, I think it's my proudest achievement, you know, and uh, my proudest achievement was the first man I taught how to read and write, mm -hmm. you know, and I think, you know, and I remember his name was Charles, and I remember one day we were sitting down, and he was reading, and he stopped, you know, and he looked at me. He said, "Man, you done open up the world to me," you know, yeah. and that always stuck with me, and it always was a motivation for other men uh, that we taught how to read and write, taught about history, mm -hmm. you know, uh, 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 and, and 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 you know, just taught a lot. You know, we had to devise ways of teaching men who didn't know what unity was, didn't know the strength that comes from unity and stuff. So you have to be creative and, 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 and you know, uh, we used to have like discussions every day, we would pick a topic to talk about. Mm -hmm. And you know, and so we were able to raise the level of content. Of course we lost way more values than we won. Yeah. Because I, you know, I had an unfortunate of seeing so many men go insane. Mm -hmm. And then 
kill themselves, men cut themselves, injure themselves just to get out of the cell. Or they, in their mind, they think that's going to get them out of CCR right. or at least take them to the hospital and catch them up and bring them back, put them right in the cell, you know. And guys go, oh, you know, insane. And usually, when a guy loses it, you know, he starts screaming. Mm -hmm. And he, he, you know, folds himself into a fetal position. You know, he's on the floor of the cell or on his bump or something like that, you know. And so that was a constant challenge to me, you know. Uh, the fact that I was in self-educated, the fact that, you know, I was political, you know, made me, the awareness made me know that the possibility was even greater. And so, uh, you know, there were times I used to wonder if this going to be the day, you know. Yeah. It seemed like, I mean, just the, this idea of kind of struggling against something in prison, even if you're losing, uh, it just seemed so key. I, when I was in prison for two years, I was with two other people, and it was exactly the same. I mean, we, we always had something, whether it was like trying to get a phone call or trying to see each other, you know, some little battle. And that really, I think more than anything, kept me sane. Um, just having that kind of thing to push against all the time. Because there's also, I'm curious if you experienced this, you know, other than the, this fear of that kind of panic and breaking down, there was a seduction to just letting go. And like, I could get into a state where I'm like, just not really thinking and just kind of like floating and waiting for the time to pass. And it's like I'm disappearing almost. And uh, if I wasn't diligent about not doing that, it would, that would just be the natural course, and I think that's how a lot of people just slip into the this kind of insanity. Yeah, I mean, you know, when you're being confined to, you know, a lot of people ask me what it's like, and I always tell them, uh, it's try to stay in your bedroom mm -hmm. for 23 hours, yeah. or go out in the backyard and draw a nine by six square, and stay inside that square for 23 hours. And you you have you never really know unless you experience it, but you'll have some idea of what the men and women and children who are placed in solitary uh, go through, you know. And so you know, what I mean, a lot of the worries that I had, the fact that I'm out now, are still with me. Yeah. You know, they you know you you can't lock a person up for almost forty five years in a, in a nine by six cell and don't do some damage, you know, but as I said, uh, you know, uh, the qualities of a humanity that my mom instilled in me became the foundation and the awareness and, 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 and the determination of the Black Panther Party, uh, you know, gave me a tool to use. So a cell that was meant to be a dead chamber, I turned it into a high school and a college in a law clinic and, you know, and in a debate hall, you know, and, and so, you know, that's how I was able, uh, you know, to, to first maintain my sanity mm -hmm. and to function at a very high level of moral principles and values and develop a, a, a unbelievable self-discipline. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I said, I think I was like in my, early part is around 41 or 42 when the values and principles, it, you know, that I had been living by all that time, I internalized them. They became a part of every vibe of me, my heart, my soul, you know, my mind and stuff. And it was like I recommitted myself. I'm like, so whatever it takes, I won't let these people break me. I won't stop what I'm doing, and even if, even if it's me losing my life. And so that's pretty much how, you know, I live my life in solitary. And I think, you know, it helped me uh, to grow as a human being and, 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 you know, to transform, you know, a pretty thing, you know. And, you know, in the book, you know, at, at the front of the book, there's a poem called Echoes. And it's about my relationship with my mom, you know, and it pretty much says everything, you know. And, uh, so that's pretty much how, you know, you know uh, I lived my life for almost 45 years. Yeah.
I'm curious, um, I mean, I think in 